Hey guys, Michael here from Conversations with a Recovering Loan Officer, and I'm joined today by my special guest, Joe Shaw. You go by Joe, right? I do, I do. Yeah. And Joe um, has a very interesting background for those loan officers out there who are listening today, and that is you came from the dark side. Is that right? I did. I was actually a realtor first. Oh, hey. And so what, what was that process like for you? Like, when did you decide to become a real estate agent? What was it that drew you to that profession? Talk me through it. So I've always liked houses um, and I've always thought architecture was neat. I actually took, uh, when I first went to college, I thought I wanted to be an architect. And then uh, I discovered about two quarters in of taking ar architecture classes that you really had to get a master's and then you had to go through um, an apprenticeship and you had to do all this stuff. And so there was basically no way I was ever gonna be an architect. Yeah, too um, much, too much work. Yeah, by a long shot. So that's when I changed my my business degree. So um, I, with that with that interest in mind, um, pre COVID, I was, um, you know, always gone. Leave at seven thirty in the morning, get home at seven thirty at night, work half a day on Saturday. I mean, just always busy uh, with work. And then all of a sudden, with COVID, nobody's at my desk anymore, and I can suddenly get. Uh, you know, my 60 hour week job done in under 25 hours. So I have this time on my hands. Uh, so I decided at that point that I was going to look into uh, real estate and get my real estate license. It would be something that was just fun to do. Didn't expect to make a career out of it. And so then uh, then I, I sold my first house um, to somebody I worked with, and then the second one, and the third one, and the fourth one. Um, and all of a sudden I was making almost as much money doing real estate as I was with my corporate job. So then when they started to talk about making us return to the office, it was a very, very easy decision for me to decide to just, you know, let that go and then stick with real estate and, and go forward. So when you got your license as a real estate agent, right, there's a process, there's testing, there's education, and then you got set up with a brokerage, I'm assuming, in your area. Yep. So what was that process like? How did you, you know, give us some insight as to what realtors are doing when they're moving through their licensing process and when they're trying to find the right home and anything that they might need to look out for? That'd be useful. Yeah, so when you first get your real estate license, um, it, it appears on the service to be super, super cheap to do. Uh, what they don't tell you, though, is that after you take the classes, which is not expensive, you pass the exam, which is not expensive. It's really not that much different than becoming a loan officer. Um, but then by the time that you pay your MLS fees and you pay for um, your super door access and you pay for you know all these ancillary, tiny little ancillary things, I mean, you're into it for thousands of dollars before you even talk to your first client. Um, a lot of the brokerages out there, um, they all offer training. Very few of them actually offer leads, um, but the training that they offer in my opinion, is some very, very subpar. Um, if I had to do it again, I would have probably joined a team and somebody who uh, who I could actually directly learn from. Um, I had said I joined a very small boutique little brokerage that uh, I thought was going to have people that I could learn from. And it didn't work out quite the way that I expected it to uh, because, I mean, they had their own businesses to run and, and you can't fault them for that. But it, it left a lot lacking when it came time for me to figure out where to actually find leads and uh, how to move forward. Um, so I ended up joining uh, EXP, which most people are familiar with. EXP was a great company, um, still is. And they offered a lot of training. The guy that brought me in um, worked with me quite a bit to, to, learn, to learn the systems, learn how it actually works, learn the contracts. Um, and then I made the mistake. There's so many people, what, so when realtors complain about phone calls and they complain about how many phone calls they're getting, we automatically go to the idea that it's loan officers calling them, which it is. But in addition to that, they're constantly getting calls from, and I, I don't want to name any specific companies, but they're constantly getting calls from people who are trying to sell them leads, you know, sell them, you know, a whole variety of things all the time. So it's not just us that's calling them. And so that we kind of have to break through that and give them some type of value for their time. Um, I mean, case in point, I made the mistake in my first year of, I thought, well, you know, if I go with this lead generation company, if I make even one closing off of it, then, you know, I will all end up great. I spent $6,000 and got nothing out of it. 
hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of phone calls. Um, but they were they were split leads. And this is what newer realtors are dealing with because they don't know where to find business. And I think that that's where we as loan officers can come in to help them a lot is not really necessarily provide. I mean, obviously we can close loans, but the truth of the matter is any loan officer can close a loan. But the loan officers that take the time to learn how lead generation works, talk them through their business, help them with marketing, those are the ones that are actually going to find continual ongoing business. So providing a unique value proposition outside of, I've got good rates, I'll close your loan, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I'm a knowledgeable loan officer because like you said, that's a bit of a commodity these days, right? If you're if you're in the business of closing loans, will you sort of need to assume you can close a loan? Right. And so let me ask this question. I think it's a little skewed now, but back then when you were a real estate agent, what were you looking for in a lender partner? So the truth of the matter is I didn't know. Um, all that I knew as a, as a real estate agent was that uh, a lender was somebody that I needed uh, I needed a, a pre-approval letter, letter from. Um, as far as what they did or what their role in the transaction was, was nobody really ever taught that. Nobody talked about that on the other side. And so that's one of those called unique propositions that we can give is especially when you're chasing newer realtors that have not actually closed anything is rather than just saying, yep, as you said, I've, I've got the rates and I can get your loan closed. I'll get you paid. It's explain them what it is that we do, you know, show them our systems a little bit, show them how rates work. You know, they make them more knowledgeable because there is nobody teaching that on the other side. And so by helping them understand a bit more about, you know, I mean, you could say real estate is a like the drive, the, the home is a driving force in the transaction because that's what they're seeking to buy, but they can't get it unless they're a cash buyer without the financing. So it makes sense practically for a real estate agent to have a level of knowledge about mortgage. I'm not saying get a license, which is what you did coincidentally, but um, understand the basics so that you can, you know, be dangerous in the field, so to speak. Right. You know, and likewise, us learning about what it is that they do, I I feel like I'm a far more effective loan officer than 80% of everybody who's out there because I understand both sides of the transaction and I know what's happening um, and I know how to read a contract. I know what everything, everything, every word in that contract means. Um, my realtor partners know that they can absolutely call me if they need to, um, to even go over terms or how verbiage should be or whatever. I mean, if you're ever unsure, still refer them back to their broker, but you know, us learning their job is just as important as them them learning ours and then understanding to stay in your lane once you have that. But being that uh, trusted advisor is a word that got thrown around in my, my previous career a lot. So being that trusted advisor goes a long way. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. I'm wondering if there's some sort of like a uh, strategy where as a loan officer, you could sort of offer to be a real estate assistant for a week or two or for like a day or two for a realtor and just to like absorb their daily lives, their jobs, their tasks, mm -hmm. how they're working their contracts because I think a lot of a lot of loan officers, okay, I only come from the the mortgage side. And in my offices growing up, it was always like real estate agents are lazy. It's like they're they are um uh, soccer moms who are bored, you know, it's like mm -hmm. the edge of barriers to entry are so low. Anyone can do it, you know, it's just like and I think a lot of that is could be said the real estate agents feel the same way about loan oh, officers, yeah. right? And, it, and it's because there are always bad eggs in every industry, and there are always some very good professionals, and real estate's no exception. There's some amazingly talented people selling real estate. Mm -hmm. They got into it because they love the homes, like you suggested. You just loved architecture. You wanted to be around it. It made you happy. And so, you know, that's uh, something that's really important to remember. So I'm wondering if that's a strategy. Get in there meet realtors offer to shadow them who knows yeah i mean and there are there are definitely um i know that one of, one of the top realtors that i work with uh, he will happily let you shadow every part of, of his transaction if, if you really want to uh, he has no problem doing it he teaches new agents all the time and so you know everybody else needs to stay away from him because he's mine but uh well, we don't know his name so it's okay <laughs> but uh um, but somewhere in the u.s there is right. this realtor who will let you do it I'll even narrow it down to Florida for you. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, and, and he would happily let you. And, and he's not the only one. You just have to find find a mentor, find somebody who is a real estate agent mentor, and they will 
probably happily let you, especially if you're telling them, hey, I'm trying to get better at my job by learning yours. You know, they're probably going to be very receptive to that. How do you solve somebody else's problems without knowing what their problems are? Right. You can't. And like loan officers, most of the time, and I've managed, you know, 50 loan officers in my career, and I talk to thousands of them yearly, mm -hmm. most of them are worried about their own trash can fire. Right. Very rarely does that fall into the real estate side. They're putting out their own fires before you even get to that. See, and what's funny about that is with their own their own fires and that side of it, I've found that proper planning prevents most of those fires from happening in the first place, leaving you free to do, uh, I mean, case in point, not to toot, toot my own, tout my own, however it says anyway here, but um, in my case, you know, we have enough, we've gotten to the point now where we get enough paperwork up front to where I, I have two, three, four conditions. And that's it. There is no fire because between, you know, myself and my team, we've put them out before we ever even get there by proper planning. And so that allows us to not only, you know, every, every single transaction, uh, we pick up the listing agent as another client of ours because they look at that and go, wow, my loan officer doesn't do that. Um, you know, because we're, we're clear to close in 10 to 12 days with minimal stress. Yeah. And that's huge, right? That proper planning. And so sort of one thing I try to coach loan officers on is which what you describe is playing offense in your mortgage business. This whole idea that if you plan correctly, you do the work up front, even if it does feel painful, do it up front is going to save you a lot of pain in the long run and a lot of time because, and stress, you just having to get, like you said, putting out that fire is a stressful thing. Um, mm -hmm. might as well stop it from happening to begin with. So that's good advice. But I guess what I'm saying too, is on the real estate side, they've got their own issues and problems and stuff that you don't see typically as a loan officer. So by putting their pants on for the day and, or the week and shadowing them and learning more about their business, you, like you were saying, you will be able to speak more effectively to real yep. estate agents about how you can help them. Absolutely. It's like um, one that, that I do uh, on, a, on a regular basis because, you know, a lot of a lot of um, our closings are remote now. And so I know several loan officers that have, that have effectively kicked their feet up and they don't leave their house, you know, unless it's for a coffee meeting somewhere. Yep. And so what I do to combat that is, especially if it's like a New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey client, which we get a lot in Florida, is I go to inspections. Now, I don't stay through the end. I don't want to see the inspection report. I don't want to know any of that. But... Um, there's nothing wrong with going to the inspection, hanging out with the real estate agent for a few minutes, meeting your client, because maybe the only time you get to um, talk to the inspector a little bit, because they'll talk to you about what they're looking at, what they're looking for, and learn a little bit about that process, because it is a very large part of what we do, especially if, especially when it comes to, if you're doing a bunch of FHA and you learn the FHA guidelines, it's very easy for you to walk to the house now and, and walk out the back door and go, oh, there's no railing there. Make a mental note of it so that you know that's coming. Yeah. It's because, again, that's prep work, right, in advance so that you don't have to get the appraisal. You're, you send it to your processor. You don't look at it. The processor kind of, you know, depending on how good your team is, maybe they don't catch it. It gets the underwriting. The underwriter catches it. Now you guys are scrambling. And five days has passed since you got the appraisal. Yep. And when it was reviewed... And now you're trying to get docs out and you've got a reinspection that needs to happen and you've got all this other stuff. So, I mean, that's good. I've never actually heard of a loan officer going to the inspections, but that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. I, I do it actually fairly, I'd say probably two out of every five. I attend, I attend an inspection. And then a lot of times just like so meet the client, I can shake their hand, look them in the eye, smile. Um, it helps you, helps me keep from getting shopped because remember they're, they're the inspection happens in the first five days yep. and if you're going to get shopped it's in the first five days and it's really difficult for you to shop me if i've shook your hand smiled had a personal conversation with you you know done all those things because now you're where we've become you know friendly so investing a bit of time let's say 30 minutes meeting them walking around looking at their house talking to them about how they're going to paint this room yep. you know doing that kind of stuff builds a personal relationship with somebody who you may have been separated through a screen or through a phone, and it's dip more difficult to build, uh, you know, commitments or relationship with them. That's yeah, I love that. That's great. 
So that, you know, I mean, you're talking about doing some really unique things as far as like getting out there and, and meeting people in person. That all takes time though. So talk to me about how you're managing your time. So my team actually consists of two of us. Um, so a uh, friend of mine, um, another loan officer in our in though, um, had this had this great idea a while back about uh, splitting a team in two. Um, and his whole idea was he wanted to, and he's not found the other person yet. Um, he is really, really good at online marketing and phone calls and doing that piece. He's not as big, however, about going out in person and meeting people and hanging out at, at mixers and having drinks and playing golf and doing that. So he and I had actually talked at one time about attempting this together and it just never painted out that way. And so I found a different loan officer who, because like you had talked about the prospecting part. So what's interesting is I myself do not prospect. Um, I do not set up, um, I do not make those those cold calls to realtors, if you will, but I do have somebody that does. And my other loan officer um, makes those phone calls and keeps up with, um, you know, past clients and does that piece of the business because I'm honestly not a fan of doing it. They, on the other hand, are not a fan of face-to-face -face playing golf, going out to inspections, doing that stuff. And so it frees me up to be able to go to coffee meetings and go to mixers and do all these things so that between the two of us, uh, we're essentially accomplishing the entire job all the time, every single day. So you're saying that you, if you're an extrovert, find an introvert who's organized. Yep. And if you're an introvert, find an extrovert that's outgoing and that likes to play golf. <laughs> Absolutely. A hundred percent. Um, and keep the calendar between the two of you. Make sure that it's very clearly defined about, you know, how it's going to happen and what's going to happen. And, you know, they, they do have, have some of their own loans. I obviously have my own loans. Um, and with the way that we're set up as a team, we have the ability to pass money back and forth between the two of us um, for, you know, efforts, you know, based on the agreement that we made. But yeah, I'll say, you know, essentially one of the greatest things that I ever learned a very, very long time ago from the very first CEO that I worked around when I was in my twenties was he, he very emphatically said that he got to where he was by knowing what he's, his weaknesses were and hiring people to fill those holes in. And a lot of people are, I don't want to say a lot, that's not fair. Um, I think that many people get in their own way because they want to do it all. They can't let it go. So they're either a control freak or they're scared of letting go of something I suffer from this for sure, especially like early on. So, you know, I tend to be very like a, like a uh, idea person and mm -hmm. I, I can take an idea and I can kind of get it off the ground and then, and then, um, I try to hold on to it. But lately I've found exactly what you suggested was that I'm just frankly, not the best at most things. Right. You know, I've got my lane. I'm really good at one thing. Uh, and I should focus on that because if my business like your business, right, is reliant on those relationships growing, then you should be just focused on that 100%, just going out there building relationships. Yep, absolutely. And and that's that's my strength is going out and, uh, and drinking. That's my strength. Uh, no, but go, <laughs> going out and um, and meeting people face-to-face -face and smiling and, and having, you know, having lunch, having coffee, having face-to-face -face conversations like this. Um, you know, building building that rapport and that that long term commitment between uh, them and ultimately us. That is my strength. My strength is not, however, convincing you that you should allow me to do that. Yeah. And so then, your does your partner, your loan partner, ever feel like you're you're not working because you're out there playing golf? Not at all. Um, because because they don't want to be out there doing that. Yeah. Uh, they 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 want to sit in the house and not go anywhere, and um, you know they they actually have have children, and it frees them up to make sure that they can go to child soccer games and do what they need to do. So it it actually works out really really well. So it's about finding that right partner, and did, did you just happen to luck across this person, or how did mm -hmm. you connect? I did. Um, and it we it was just it was a, a whole group of conversations. Um, you know, as as I was talking to other loan officers about. Uh, what was holding their business back. And then, uh, you know, that led into a conversation about what was holding my business back. And, you know, it, it's it's not a 100% perfect pairing, but it's pretty close, uh, yeah. you know, and and it, it all came from this this idea that, um, 
that, you know, another loan officer in Orlando had about, you know, that because he feels that all loan officers should actually be pairs. That's smart. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I'm not organized enough to be a loan officer. You know, I struggle. I struggled for years and years. Come, I came up with systems, and eventually, I just had to build software, right, to make yeah. it happen because I couldn't organize it myself. So, build something. But so that's you know all part of your strengths. Then is sort of surrounding the customer relationship, the the going out there and attracting new referral partners. Mm -hmm. But it all is part of sales, right? And so as an so as sales is concerned, like what is a myth that you feel like you could debunk about sales? So it's actually funny you asked that because I don't know where it went. Anyway, um, there's a book I've been reading, which has been lying on my desk up until right this very second. Um, and it actually opens with talking about the fact that uh, when, especially people that are, uh, I'm 44, so people that are older, older than me, when they think about sales, they think of, you know, that, that slimy used car salesman guy, and it makes their skin crawl. They don't want to be part of it. And what they're actually missing is the idea that we are all salespeople. Every interaction is a sale. At the end of the day, I say, you, you know, when, when two of you walk up to the same door at the same time, right? Somebody's going to open the door and one he's going to go through first. And it is a bit of a sales process between the two of you to decide who's going to go through first. There's some pleasantries and everything exchanged for you or whatever, but everything is a sale and it's not always a win, a win lose. A lot of times it's a win win because in that case, everybody got through the door correctly. And that's the biggest misconception about sales is that it's not a slimy process. It's most of the time can be a win win as long as everybody is uh, being open, honest, and fair about what they want in the end. Yeah, that's really cool. I love that. Yeah, and I, I do think that's something that um, that I need to work with my kids on a bit more because you know they're. I think generally speaking, kids are kind of like give me, give me, give me. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, that would be really good for them to kind of understand that hey, life's about um, this. It's in sales, life is about you know bringing value to other people and exchanging yeah. that value and. Yeah, I love that. When you have a chance to find that book name, send it over to me, please. Yep, absolutely. Be happy to. Awesome. So, so you've identified that you know sales is about bringing value, and every interaction's a sale. And now you're on the mortgage side. So, when did you get into loans as opposed to real estate? So my problem with my problem being a realtor is it's boring. It's, I think it's boring. Um, so the sales cycle of a realtor is essentially find your client. Um, now, mind you, our market now is different, you know, whenever, but this is, you know, at the beginning, the beginning of COVID before everything went absolutely crazy. Um, so the, the, the normal sales cycle for a realtor is simple. You find a client, you, uh, find out what it is that they want. You find their houses, you send them a list, they look at them, you settle in on four or five, you go and you look at them, you put a contract in and you move on. And then you effectively turn the process over to everybody else. So say your transaction coordinator, the loan officer, the title company, and you pretty much hang out through the rest of it. And I know I'm going to get hate from realtors for saying that, but that, that really is, you know, their, you know, their, their biggest thing at that point is to um, play psychologist and quell the fears of the, the buyer, really, is what it comes down to. And you just kind of explain the process. I was not a fan. Um, so I met a loan officer here in Tampa, and he and I became really good friends. And uh, I started hanging out in his office and seeing what he did. And my um, having a business degree and really enjoying numbers, I really liked what he was doing. Um, and I realized that I would much prefer to do that. And so I decided on like a Monday that I was going to, and I say like a Monday, it really was a Monday, decided on Monday that I was going to get my MLO license. Um, I looked online on Monday morning, realized there was a five-day class that was starting that day um, that I was able to sign up for. Yep. Signed up for the five-day class. By Friday, was done with the class, took the test the following Monday and failed it. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> very common. I mean, just being, I, I failed it by, so with, with that, Yes, they obviously tell you what your score is. So I actually failed it by one question. I was so disappointed. Um, but you have to wait 30 days before you can take it again. Um, and so, you know, the second time around, I passed with flying colors without a problem. But uh, 
And that was that was pretty much it. I was saying that was all she wrote. Um, I I had a couple of deals going as a real estate agent, but um, didn't take on any new clients. Just started doing referrals and just referring everything out, and uh, started to dive into the world of being an MLO. Um, and man, they have never looked back. Um, yeah. I don't. My license is in a uh, referral status. Um, I have not even taken a referral on my license uh, in more than a year. Yeah. So you're full in, fully committed, but oh, yeah. still interacting with realtors. So talk to me about that. How are you prospecting for them? How do you identify a possible model match realtor mm -hmm. for you and your business? What are you looking for? Um, are there any red flags as a, you know, when you're out there talking to people? Yeah. So for me, you do business, uh, people do business with people that they like, and we all know that. Um, and so for me, it's, it's very much that way. I would say, I do not hide the fact that, um, I'm a Freemason. Um, everybody out there and a Shriner. Um, and so people out there have their own preconceived nation, narrow, you know, notions about said fraternity. Um, as you can over here, as you can see over here, I don't hide it, you know? Um, and so when I go out looking for realtor partners, I'm looking for partners that are like-minded in the way that I am. I so, see you know, I'm very, very tattooed. Um, I do ride a motorcycle, um, you know, so on and so forth. And so. I mean, case in point, when I first, because you know, when I first started my podcast originally, uh, I was doing it live every Friday afternoon. And um, the second one in, my mom was watching it and I'm sitting there drinking a glass of whiskey on camera. And her first question is, well, what if people don't like it? I said, well, mom, those aren't my people. And I've effectively used that to my advantage the entire time. And I do business with uh, people that I feel like we could go and, and have dinner with or go and hang out with or whatever. It's not to say that I'll turn down other business, but those are the people that I look for. So the red flags for me are, I always answer my phone. Um, if I'm on the golf course and you call me, I would say, I may answer my phone and say, hey, hold on, I'm teeing off, put it on speakerphone and toss it on, on the, uh, you know, the box and then you'll hear me tee off and then I'll pick it up. Um, I actually had a realtor one time say, you really do always answer your phone. Um, cause that's a true story. It happened. And, you know, so people that don't answer their phone, you know, I actually have a, have a ticker in my, uh, my CRM, um, for the number of times in a row that somebody's not answered their phone. And when I hit that number, then they effectively get moved to a, to a different bucket. And I'm not as concerned with reaching out to them anymore. Um, because I answer my phone. So I, for me, it's it's finding like-minded people that work the same way that I do because at the end of the day, there's enough business for all of us that I don't feel like I have to go chasing people and forcing a relationship. Yeah. And forced relationships never work, right? You're it's a uh, very transactional. So are you when you're seeking out, you know, a, a potential referral partner, are you looking for somebody who can transcend the transactional boundaries and move into more of a relational like position? Like, are you looking for friends? Or are you looking for? I'm looking for professional friends. Um, you know, I, whether it's, uh, I have a couple of realtors that I, we go and, and I ride the motorcycles with. Um, I'm very into cars. I have uh, two realtors that we go to car shows. Um, I have one that we go to, to rock shows with. Um, I have another one that we've been on vacation with before, um, you know, so I, I am looking for professional friends. Some of them cross way further into the friend boundary than others, but yes, at the end of the day, um, I like, I like to know about, about their families and their kids and, you know, what's going on. And I like to talk about, you know, my dog and my family and, you know, I, I want it to be more than just a more than, more than just a transactional relationship. And it goes back to that idea of, you know, when I shake your hand and look you in the eye and we walk through the house and we talk about what colors things are going to be in, this is, you know, little Billy's room and, you know, whatever we talk about those things, you no longer shop me because I'm real. And that's the way I am with my realtor partners it is it is much harder for you as a loan officer to call one of my realtors and rip them away from me because we always get it done, but they're also my friend. I think that's huge. How do you identify that person? You know, like, are you, you said you don't make the calls to set up the appointments. Is that, mm -hmm. so who's making those calls? What is the process for identifying? Should they call somebody? Are they calling any realtor out there that does business? Are they doing some, 
you know, kind of like searching on the web to figure out what kind of people they are, what kind of production they do? Uh, uh, production, yes. So what we did is, is I had a realtor partner of ours take uh, our MLS and cross-reference everybody that had sold X number of transactions in the last 12 months. And we then took that list and we gave it to a virtual assistant um, who went out and pulled as many cell phone numbers as she could find, and it netted us 947 realtors. Uh, we then took that list and started narrowing it down from there. And, um, you know, my partner's been calling said list and setting up coffee appointments. And what's interesting about it is the people that are actually meeting with us for the most part end up being the people we want to do business with anyway. And I, I'm not sure if that's why that's happening that way, or maybe it's just because I don't care who you are. If you call me, I'll take a meeting with you. Whether I think that I'm going to, you know, if an insurance agent calls me and they want to go and have coffee, I'm probably going to learn something. So I go. Um, and so maybe it's that because I have that mentality and so do they. And so that's why, why the meetings are working. Um, but you know, it is definitely, definitely working. That's great. Yeah. It's really good to hear. And so how many of those meetings appointments are happening a week? Um, we're doing about four a week. Um, it's, it's Wednesday, Thursday only. We do one in the morning. Um, and, uh, we do them at Starbucks. Um, we got stood up for the first time today. Oh. Um, what are we the first one that we've, we've ever been stood up on. And, um, she was actually super apologetic. She forgot that she scheduled it. So it was an but, act. You know, yeah. 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 It wasn't even on purpose. Um, but what's interesting is I and myself, and this is another advice for other loan officers. When I was doing this on my own, I always shied away from your 25, 30 year realtors because they have to have loan officers that are important and they have to have, there's, there's no way we'll ever land one of those. Yeah. Those are the people we're landing. <laughs> uh, you know, they, uh, the one, the one yesterday, his, um, he sent his kid to his long-term loan officer and, um, they were kind of short with, with the kid. And he said, he just, uh, he can't get along with younger people. So he was looking for somebody younger. So you just, you never know, call them anyway. Yeah. And they can't send every loan to the same person. Like the, you know, if they've got a relationship, maybe they're really good at doing certain kinds of loans or they, they're in the retail side and they don't have access to, you mm -hmm. know, non QM programs, or they don't know how to do a VA loan. And you just need that one transaction, right. To prove that you're different. And so that's one, that's another question I have then, you know, you get a transaction with a new realtor mm -hmm. you've never worked with before. What is your, do you have any sort of special process or, um, do you have like, how do you engage with the real estate agent or on the transaction to make sure they're getting what they need, the service levels that they want? So I'm actually pretty careful up front to not do anything special for a first time realtor, which sounds really counterintuitive, except for the idea that. If I roll out the, the red carpet for you in the first two transactions, and then I treat you normally after that, you're going to go, oh, this is yeah. terrible. Whereas I would rather set an expectation up front of this is how we work and this is what we do, and then maintain that that high level the whole time so that it never you never see a decrease in it. You know what you're getting every single time. Yeah. Um, I... A lot of loan officers are not making phone calls to listing agents um, on when um, contracts are put in. And this, this comes back to you know, knowing about the realtor side of things. So one of the, the things I'm massive on, and all of my realtors know it, is that I call listing agents every single time. I don't care where I am. Um, I've, I will take 15 minutes and I will make that phone call. No matter what, um, I was in Costco, did one last weekend. And funny enough, we won that deal there were two contracts where if there were higher offers than ours. We won that deal because I called. I'm not surprised. Yeah. yeah no. Listing a district tour should, you're the only, you're the only law officer that called. And so we were comfortable that it was going to get closed. And so we took it. Yep. So it, it's bigger than people realize. So, you know, I set the tone for how it's going to go for right there. Then you move into products like yours where, you know, my, all the milestones are set up so that everybody, everybody stays. And what I found now with using your product is that I am actually getting a phone call before I have a chance to call somebody. Cause if I hit that button and then everybody's notified, you know, of the appraisal or the whatever, then it's, 
I'll get a phone call. Hey, so how did it come out? So that's that. That's the thing. I think we talked about this on our meeting recently, right? Building those email templates and maybe <laughs> prepping some videos to kind of get in front of those expectations so you can go, you know, hey, we'll know when the appraisal's back. What the we'll let you know right when we can as soon as possible what the value is if there's any repairs needed you know yep and so that's just like so using our system or whatever you can do that but i'm sure as a way of setting expectations for that listing agent i mean what does that phone call sound like are you teaching them who you are how you work okay absolutely so the it's actually funny because we do a weekly mastermind uh, here, myself and the loan officer in Orlando. Uh, we get anywhere between uh, eight and 15 people a week that show up. Um, sometimes they have questions, sometimes they don't. And this was actually discussed last week, and it was a there were some really good points made. Um, so when a loan officer calls a listing agent, they have a tendency to sell the buyer. At the end of the day, the listing agent doesn't care. They don't care about the buyer. That's not what they're concerned about. They're concerned about whether or not you can get it closed and you can get it paid. And so, yeah, sure. I start off, I start out and I tell them, yes. So say they've been through desktop underwriting, you know, um, I have all the documents in front of me. I've seen this, I've seen that, um, you know, and so they're, they're totally good. And then I transition in the first 60 seconds off that buyer into me, you know, and I start talking about my team and you know, the, the weight that's behind me and what we get done and the speed that we do it and the systems we have in place for communication purposes. And, you know, the fact that they're getting a phone call every Tuesday or Wednesday, just to say, hi, this is where we're at. This is what's going on, you know, and you don't answer your phone. That's fine. We'll leave you a voicemail and, and you're going to get this and this and this and this, and this guarantees a smooth transaction because that's really what they want to hear at the end of the day is it's okay who's going to get this closed for me because you know every single one of those officers have or officers i'm sorry offers as a pre-approved buyer attached yep and in theory every loan officer already did their job so you selling that buyer means nothing it's a matter of what are you going to do to get this done yeah that makes a lot of sense because the mortgage is the same essentially right it's right. a conventional buyer there are other offers a conventional buyer the bank, it's going to get sold anyways to the same bank. You know, it's so the difference is the person behind it who's pushing on the gas pedal to make it happen. And so you can put yourself like you're doing. You put yourself out there saying, I got a heavy foot. I'm going to push this through. It's going to get closed. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Absolutely. So then you, you know, you've talked a little bit about, um, you know, your team and how you, you know, kind of happened across a great partner. Um, you've got other team members as well. They help maybe process the loans or that kind of stuff. How are you handling management today? Like when you're, you know, do you have a management style? I do. Um, so my my management style comes from from years of corporate life um, and managing people in corporate life. At the end of the day, every, at the end of the day, I look at it this way. I say my the other people on my team, you know, my processor, the other loan officer, they depend on me to do my job. You know, they don't have time to look over my shoulder to make sure that I'm actually attending meetings. I'm actually making phone calls to our current uh, realtor partners, and I'm making phone calls to you know that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Likewise. I don't have time to be looking over their shoulder either. I say, I don't look at it. When, when I say my team, I mean the team that I'm attached to. I don't mean necessarily my team, even though it's my name on the, the Shaw Mortgage Solutions. Um, it's a, I look at, and everybody is an integral part to the same team and we're all the same level and it takes all three of us to get it done. Um, and that is effectively my management style is that we're all the same team. We're all the same level. We're all working towards the same goal. And it doesn't happen with all three of us anyway. So there is no time to be looking over each other's shoulder and make sure things are getting done. Is there any sort of um, like check-in, accountability, like uh, review, like you guys meet quarterly and just like review everything? How do, how do you approach that? So um, we actually, we end up talking uh, on a very regular basis uh, anyway, like daily. Um, but as far as the, the checks and balances go, because things do fall through the cracks. And like when you look at our, our CRM, for instance, uh, one of the smartest things that we did 
is there's two columns of the CRM and it's just a straight date column. And it sits there next in, in pretty much every single screen that we're in when it comes to contacts. And what those two date columns are for is one is labeled for my partner, one of them is labeled for me. And what it ends up being is if it's something that I'm supposed to follow up on, then there'll be a, a date in my partner's column where, where they say, where it's, you know, Joe should be, follow, essentially Joe should be following up by this date. And then the other column is where I click it and I put, you know, change the date to whatever I want, but I put a date in there when I do follow up, that way they can see that I'm following up. So when I look at contact, like when I, when I look at our new contacts, I can see what they're doing because they have follow-up dates in all of them. When it comes to our old contacts, they can see my column of dates and they can see the last time that I've followed up with people. And so it creates this level of accountability between the two of us on a continual basis without anybody having to tap the other one on the shoulder. Which is huge then, because you could just in 30 seconds, you can just take a look at the pipeline, just move your head from top to bottom, see if anything's missing. And then if there is, I guess you can just kind of check in with them and see, see what's up or how you can help. That makes a lot of sense. I love it. So how do you feel? So, I mean, you're doing on a daily, weekly basis, you are out there talking to prospecting new realtor relationships. You come from that background. How do you feel about prospecting for it? Is it something you get charged up for? Or is it something you kind of dread? How do you, how do you approach it? I hate prospecting. Um, so my background is I, I started out in the corporate world with, uh, with Time Warner Cable. Um, very, you know, many, many, many years ago, um, in a call center. Um, and I started out as a, as a call center rep, um, you know, taking 80 to hundred phone calls every single day, talking about people's bills, just, it was horrible. <laughs> and, um, I moved into management there. Um, I then managed a call center for the American Heart Association once upon a time, which was, that was, you know, managing people doing outbound calls, asking for money. Yep. And in order to understand what they were going through, that meant that, you know, I was doing at least 200 calls a month, which is not like they were doing 100 plus a day. But no, I do not like to cold call at this point. I don't like to do prospecting. I've done so much of that in my life that I am emphatically avoid it. Fortunately, you know, it needs to happen and you found somebody who's good at it to do it for you. And all right. you have to do is go out there and build relationships with them once those appointments are set up. Yep. So that's great. Um, so... At what point do you stop? I mean, do you ever stop? Is there a perfect number of realtors? And if you achieve that number, is there like a time when you pull back from prospecting? Or do you just like, do you find another loan officer, bring them onto your team, help them prospect, keep growing that way? I mean, what do you think? I would love to, I would love to see there come a point in a few years where you just bring another loan officer on, um, you know, and in my mind, I would want to find somebody who was new and hungry, but didn't necessarily know how to find their own business and then uh, more or less bring them in to uh, another extrovert, if you will, um, you know, that, okay, well, we just start feeding them business too. We just continue to grow that way and, and you know, just let it continually organic, organically grow and, and see where it ends up. I mean, um, you know, my goal is to be retired by 65. So we've got 21 years of growth in front of us. Um, but, you know, it's, it's going to be a continual process that will never stop. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And you grow your team as as opposed to just scaling back your efforts if you've got a mm -hmm. system that works. Yeah, that's awesome. So we talked a lot about realtors, but there are other referral sources out there for mortgage loans today. Yep. Um, you know, is there a better referral source? And if not, or like if there is, who is it? And if not, what other kinds of sources might you be talking to? I wouldn't call it better, and not everybody has the stomach for it, but um, divorce attorneys are actually really good. Um, and the thing, the thing about divorce attorneys and working with a divorce is you will get multiple deals out of the same run because typically there's a marital home. Something's got to be done with. It's either going to get refinanced or move somebody off or... Uh, it's going to get sold and they're both going to buy a property or whatever. And so you have to have the stomach for the idea that um, one, or, one or the other of them may not want to talk to you. And so you have to be good enough to be able to say, hey, I don't work for your ex. I actually work for you as well. Here's why, here's how, here's whatever in order to earn the business. But the 
I hate to say advantage because it's such a ter- and divorce is such a terrible thing. Yeah. But the advantage to it at the end of the day is they have so many things going on that they don't really want to go shopping. So they, as long as you you approach it from a place of empathy, um, you know, they're very, very receptive to it. So, you know, and as far as divorce attorneys go, them having a good lender in their pocket that can help with true financial advice isn't a bad thing either. Um, and there are programs out there where you can get divorce certified, um, which I've done, to talk about... Um, the, the tax loopholes and the, you know, all the things that come with taking a marital property and splitting it into. Nice. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I never actually thought that deeply about the divorce thing, but there are, there is an opportunity to help kind of them through that transitionary period. And like you said, multiple transactions is, Mm -hmm. you know, a possibility, which is obviously really great. Yeah. Um, any last thoughts or advice that you can think of that, you know, our listeners might want to know? Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, the biggest thing that I see in all of the forums everywhere is, you know, should I buy leads of some kind? And to me, the answer to that is always 100% no. Um, there's so much organic stuff out there that can be accomplished by, because even before my partner came along, I was making phone calls. So you have to do it. Um, and a very good mentor of mine once said, there are very few problems in this business that can come up that cannot be solved by picking up a telephone. And that is probably the best advice that I've received in my three years of doing this. Nice. So pick up your phone. Don't be afraid to dial. Yep. You know, talk to your realtors, talk to your friends and family, remind them who, who you are, what you do. And Absolutely. So, I mean, do you have a certain number of calls you're trying to make a day? I mean, how do you organize that? Um, I think it's more a week. Uh, we're, we're trying to do... We're trying to do like 50 to 70 calls a week, but then once we have our four appointments set for the next week, we're, we kind of stop as well. Okay. So there, there's not really a, I guess there's not really a set number. So it's kind of a, if we get our four appointments in the first four four phone calls, then we're probably done for the week because we don't have more time than that anyway. Um, but if it takes 60 calls, you know, we only get three appointments out of it, then we made our 60 calls, we move on. I'm wondering if, you know, my mind is always going toward, okay, he's saying that if you can be at the four appointments, you can stop making the calls. How do we scale this? So you might make less calls, get more appointments, mm-hmm. so that you can get on the course earlier. Right. You know? <laughs> I'm sure that you're thinking through that too. Oh yeah, absolutely. Nice. Well, Joe, it's been a great talking to you. I appreciate you joining me today on Conversations with a Recovering Loan Officer. And I'm looking forward to working with you uh, in pre-approve me and watching yeah. your business um, blow up. So- Uh, It's great talking, and thanks for joining me. Hey, thank you for having me. All right, Joe. Thanks.